Um, and so how about, say, the fifth shell? What are the possible, um, how, how many subshells does the fifth shell have? How many subshells total should it have? Four. Now notice five. how five. The first shell has one subshell, the second <coughs> shell has two subshells, the third shell has three subshells, and the fourth shell has four subshells. So the fifth shell should have five subshells. What would be the L numbers? Zero, one, two, three, or four. That's right. Even though there's five of them, they only go from zero to four. Um, and their letters would be S, P, D, F. People don't usually give a letter to this, but I guess it would be G. From this point on, you just start using the alphabet. So if you were going to put in a letter, it would be G. But usually at this point, they would just use the L's. OK. All right, so for me, this is the easiest way to figure out the possible L's. But the way the textbook puts it is like this. L goes from 0 to n minus 1. The, the key point here is that means the number of possible subshells is always equal to the shell that you're in. So let's say that n equals 3. Is it possible for the third shell to have an l equal to 4? No. No. Is it possible for the third shell to have an l equal to 3? No. Could it have an l equal to 2? Yes. Yeah. What are the possible l's here? 2, 1, and 0. Yeah. All right. So this is the most common one for people to, to forget. It seems logical that if your n is 3, your l could be 3. But because we start the numbering for the l's at 0, the L's only go to n minus 1. So this is the most common trap to watch out for when you're doing uh, exam problems and homework problems. L can't go all the way up to n. It can only go to n minus 1. So for example, suppose that n was equal to 2. Could L be 2? No. Yeah, what are the possible L's here? Yeah, two subshells, but they start at 0. All right, I think you might already be starting to figure out how to work some of the parts of the problem, but there's still one or two other ideas we'll need to finish the problem. Uh, namely, each of these subshells is split up into orbitals. <coughs> each of these subshells is split up into orbitals. Actually, let's ask ourselves, uh, how many electrons can fit in the 2s subshell? 2. How about in the 3s subshell? 2. How do you know? Because there's two columns. Mm -hmm. How many electrons can fit into a p subshell? Do you have your periodic table with you? Let's take a look at the periodic table. How many electrons can fit into the P subshell? Me in the back cover? Um, six. Because there's six columns. How many electrons can fit into the 3P subshell? Six. Yeah. How many electrons can fit into a D subshell? Ten. And how about into the F? Ten. Oh, wait, one. Twelve. Take your time. 14. 14. All right. There's mathematical formulas that you could <coughs> learn that tell you how many electrons will fit into a subshell, but why bother when you can, when you can just read it off the periodic table? Mm -hmm. The number of columns in the periodic table tells you how many electrons can fit in there. So by the way, how many electrons can fit in total in the second shell? How many electrons can we fit in total in the second shell? How would we figure that out? The second shell is... Four plus, I mean two plus six, eight. Yeah, two electrons go fit here and six here for eight total. How about the third shell? How can we calculate the total number of electrons that could fit there? Um, two plus six is ten, so eighteen. So the third shell has the S, the P, and the D. That would be 18 electrons. And how about in the fourth shell? How will we calculate how many electrons would fit there? 16 plus, or 18 plus, um, 14. Now there's an extra 14, which I think is 32. <coughs> okay, now again, there's formulas that allow you to calculate the number of electrons. I think the formula is that the number of electrons is 2n squared. Would that have given us the right answer? 4 squared is 16. Yeah, that would give us the right answer. But why bother with the formula when you can just read it off the periodic table? So I think it's rather than using formulas here, it's better just to get as much information as you can out of the periodic table. Just by looking at the periodic table, we can see how many electrons fit into n equals 4. But that's only if you know if you count all the subshells. So it's important to have a nice periodic table labeled like this. You can count, oh, 
n equals 4 has an s, a p, a d, and an f. So you have to count all of those subshells. And then you don't need this formula for the number of electrons. <coughs> OK, now let's think about orbitals. You remember from chemistry, how many electrons can fit in one orbital? Two. That's right. Two electrons in an orbital. So how many orbitals are there in the s block? Two or one. Yeah, one orbital with room for two electrons. Mm -hmm. One orbital with room, room for two electrons. How many orbitals in the p block? How many orbitals here? Five. And how many orbitals here? Seven. That's right. The number of orbitals is half the number of electrons. So there's a formula for the number of orbitals, but you can just read that off the periodic table as well. All right, now how do we designate the orbitals? Well, for example, um, the orbitals are, um, so remember the subshells are, the shells are called n. And the subshells are called either S, P, D, and F, or they're called L. Mm -hmm. The orbitals also have what's called a quantum number. The orbital quantum number is M sub L. Mm -hmm. Now basically, the M sub Ls are just always integers centered at zero. They're always integers centered at zero. And then you can figure out how many you need. For example, how many orbitals are there in the S block? How many orbitals do we need to fit all the electrons? One. Yeah, because there's two electrons. So in this block, we can just say um, that ML is equal to zero. The zero is orbital. Mm -hmm. How many orbitals do we have in the P block? Three. Three. So in the P block, In order to get three mLs centered at zero, we'd have to go from negative one to positive one. How about in the d block? How many orbitals will we need in the d block? Five. So what would be some good numbers centered at zero for the mLs here? Zero, one, one, negative two, negative two. That would give us our five orbitals. So these are just names to give to the orbitals. The negative two orbital, the negative one orbital, the zero <coughs> orbital, the one orbital, and the two orbital. By the way, usually you don't actually use these that much in chemistry. In chemistry here, we might have called this, remember that we might have seen that you have the px, the py, and the pz orbitals. Those are the three the names that we usually use for the different orbitals uh, in the p block, px, py, and pz. But if you want to give them numbers, you would say their mls are negative one, zero, and one. All right, well, to finish off, how about if we're in the f subshell? How many orbitals do we need in the F subshell? Um, seven, so negative three, three. Okay, now, I think this is the easiest way to work this out, but the mathematical pattern is notice that ML always goes from negative L to positive L. Notice that when L is, uh, L is one, the possible MLs are from negative one to positive one. And from when L is two, the MLs go from negative two to positive two. And when L is three, they go from negative three to positive three. And remember, how about when we were in the S block? What's the L for the S block? F is, L is one. Take your time. This is the very first subshell. So what's the L number for the very first subshell? L is zero. Zero. It's easy to forget that. P has L equals one. Now, how many orbitals do we need to fit all the electrons in the S block? So what should be the ML number? Negative one, zero, one. That would give three. We only need one orbital. Uh, one. Now remember, they're supposed to be centered at zero. Zero. Okay. Notice how these are all centered at zero here. So in the S block, the only orbital is the ML equal to zero. Uh, and you can see again, that corresponds to L equals zero. When L is zero, ML can only be zero. When L is one, ML can go from negative one to positive one. When L is 2, ML can go from negative 2 to positive 2. And when L is 3, ML can go from negative 3 to positive 3. That, that's the mathematical pattern. For me, it's kind of easier to figure this out from the periodic table and just to remember, you can see from the periodic table how many orbitals you need, and you just have to remember that the numbers are centered at 0. And you can kind of figure it out. Uh, that's the way I work it out. Okay, um, and then finally, 
Remember, how many electrons can fit in an orbital? Two. Two. But the Pauli exclusion principle says that you can never have two electrons that are identical in all ways. So there must be some difference between those two electrons. <coughs> well, the difference is what's called the spin. The difference is what's called the spin. Um, the electrons can either have ms of positive one half or negative one half. And this is actually much simpler. Any electron can either be positive one half or negative one half. So no matter what orbital you're in, you can either have a plus one half or a negative one half spin. Um, so there's always two possible spins. Well, there's, 